thank you to all who are joining us this evening for the fourth topic of our Gene Site Cares webinar series. I'm Dr. Tiffany Stewart. I'm a medical science liaison at Myriad Neuroscience, and I'll be moderating tonight's dis discussion among our four brilliant panelists. So we know that the treatment for depression and anxiety works, yet far too many Americans cannot or do not avail themselves of mental health care. Why is that? There are too many reasons to count. So tonight we're gonna to address a few of them with a group of people who work every day to break down barriers to access mental health care. I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's panelists. First, we're gonna start off with Ms. Lisa Caffey. She's a nurse practitioner with Senior Wellness Group in Royal Oak, Michigan. She sees a largely senior population in a mostly rural area. Good evening, Lisa. Hello, how are you? Um, Reverend Edwin Lloyd is the pastor of the Allen Chapel AME Church in Asbury Park. He brings his belief in mental health care to his ministry and encourages members of his congregation to get help for their depression and anxiety. Good evening, Reverend Lloyd. Good evening, Tiffany. Good to see you this evening. Good to see you too. Dr. Balin A. Durr is a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist at the Will County Community Center in Joliet, Illinois. It's a federally qualified health center, FQHC, which receives federal funding and provides care to all with a focus on delivering services in areas of clinical shortage like mental health. Dr. Durr is the author of Heaven Abounds in You and has a podcast about addiction, depression, and suicide titled Today's Mental Health. And I have to say, I've listened to her podcast. I can recommend it. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany. And I'm so excited to be here, a part of this panel this evening. Well, we welcome you. We thank our panelists for their leadership and we thank all of you who are joining us and who are connected to this webinar and this cause. Remember, if you have a question, please type your question in the Q&A function. You should see a toolbar um, in your Zoom screen that has a Q&A function. So please type it there and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So we have a lot to talk about. Let's jump right in. When we talk about barriers of access to mental health care, there are both external barriers. So those are the barriers that can physically or financially reduce the likelihood of care and internal barriers. So things like personal fears, attitudes, and decisions that prevent and prohibit people from seeking the care that they need. Let's start by discussing a few external barriers. So Ms. Caffey, you work in a relatively rural area that often comes with unique barriers when accessing healthcare. What resources are, in your opinion, what resources are lacking and what do you see as the biggest need in that setting? I think overall it's considered like the four A's, accessibility, availability, affordability, affordability and acceptability. When it comes to accessibility, oftentimes the rural areas, you have only one doctor or one provider in that area. So you have very limited choice and selection in who you see. And if you aren't able to form that bond between the two of you guys, it impacts your care and your willingness to go seek out care when you need it. Um, community mental health centers normally are for crisis for the most severe. However, in the rural areas, they don't have the funding provided for them except and they're expected to take everybody else on to provide mental health care because they don't have the access, they don't have the psychiatrist or the psychologist in their area. In terms of availability, that's pretty much everywhere. There's a chronic shortage in providers, both mental health professionals, the psychologists, the psychiatrists, and that makes it even harder out in those areas. They don't have the access to them. Reimbursement. Um, Medicare and Medicaid offers different reimbursements and less pay for the rural areas. So more providers don't go out into that area. Affordability, um, there's different costs in terms of mental health care. A primary example would be when I go to my doctor, it's $15 for me to see my primary care doctor. But for me to go see a specialist, it's $50. So I'm obviously gonna go try and go to my primary care doctor first to get care before I have to spend the extra money. And oftentimes a lot of people don't have that extra money or with the rural outline areas, um, Medicare, Medicaid makes like dental an option in your 
care plan along with mental health services. So oftentimes people opt not to get the mental health services, which then they don't have the insurance in that area. They don't get the care. They don't seek out the care because they can't afford it. And then um, for acceptability, there's still the stigma of mental health out in the rural areas. They're a closer knit, tighter community. So it's more hush hush. You don't want to let it out. I don't want to go see you as a provider because what if you accidentally slip up and say something to your husband or wife at dinner and then all of a sudden she tells somebody else and it's just that telephone issue where everybody knows what's going on with you. Uh, the perception, the lack of confidentiality within the rural areas because everybody knows everybody. Mm -hmm. And then um, for some of the biggest needed areas, I think with everything going on in the pandemic with COVID that uh, telehealth is now getting easier to get reimbursed for and it's becoming more accessible. Some of the challenges in the elderly is the fact that they don't have reliable internet out in the rural areas, plus the fact the older population doesn't have the technical logical skills that the younger generations do. Like my niece can run her circles around me with electronics. But then on the, to flip the coin, it helps that it can integrate the healthcare between the the provider and the mental health provider. It reduces the need for trips to the emergency room. It reduces delays in care. So I can call you up and say, hey, I need to do a Zoom conference because I'm really having an issue right now. It also helps to improve continuity of care and follow-up. And it reduces the need for, to take time off of work, to find child care, to be able to make my appointments. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. You have mentioned a lot of challenges. So. Um... Let's try and chip away at that. I think some of the challenges you mentioned, um, like the challenge of technology, maybe not having mm -hmm. access to telehealth or internet, um, might fall into the category of societal inequities mm -hmm. um, that reduce access to care. So I'll move to Dr. Durr now. Um, Dr. Durr, we know that societal inequities lead to inequities in care. What challenges do patients and clinicians at a community health center, as, as uh, Ms. Caffey mentioned, at a community, community health center face when being treated for mental health issues that others might not face? Well, you know, what's interesting is because um, I also did telepsychiatry uh, for almost uh, nine, 10 years um, here. I'm in the Chicago area, but would see patients in Central Illinois, Centralia, Mattoon, Mount Carmel, as far south um, as Effingham, which is right across the border from St. Louis. And so, of course, because those are rural populations, some of the things that Ms. Caffey already said actually, you know, came into play. And, and frankly, some of them still come into play even with uh, the patient population that I see now, which is in Will County. It's one of the collar counties uh, of Cook County, the Chicago area. And uh, we have, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very similar, interestingly enough, because uh, it's folks still, um, they uh, are, are impoverished. Uh, some people are homeless, uh, uh, addiction is high. They have some of the same issues in terms of, um, again, not necessarily having access to technology unless it's on their phone. So they don't necessarily uh, or feel comfortable with technology. So them accessing the patient portals in order to get information or other messaging they're not necessarily doing or comfortable with. Then there are um, the issues again, because this is um, an FQHC, a community mental health center, it, we have a severe chronically mentally ill patient population, again, because we have also, we do injections. And here again in the US, that's probably more likely an indicator of the severity of the illness uh, because as, as, a, um, as a whole, our specialty uh, does not use long acting injectables uh, uh, on a regular basis. So uh, that patient population, again, because they're severely chronically mentally ill, you also see impairment in other areas in terms of uh, their mood, uh, their, their cognitive abilities, their ability to think and process information, to critically think, to prioritize, to take care of themselves. 
Uh, then there's again the issue of, of Medicaid, which Ms. Kathy also brought up, and why that's so critically important in, 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 a, in a number of ways in terms of money for both the patient and for the institution. And, uh, you know, there was something I heard Denzel Washington say, which he said, he said, money can't make you happy, but you can drive up awfully close. So, so, and the thing about that is, you know, there's so much that we need as human beings that, that money can be used to purchase for us again, right? In terms of having financial security. So when you have Medicaid, my patients, we have difficulty getting uh, certain medications authorized and approved for them. Um, as a matter of fact, I wrote a quote from one of them, which is one of my patients, uh, I'm not going to go into the details about it, but had a valid diagnosis, had been on multiple medication trials and okay. failed. And what they said was, there is no evidence that the request for uh, this particular medicine, which was one of the eight, one of the newer atypical antipsychotics, meets the criteria for this health plan for non-preferred formulary agent, including evidence that the member has tried and failed at least two formulary preferred agents, each for at least a 90-day trial were applicable, or that the member has some contraindication or intolerance. So part of the reason I read that to you is because you notice the specificity of it. So not only is it a diagnosis, which uh, in some cases has been incorrect because if you have bipolar disorder, that's one of the qualifying diagnoses. But if in, this, in the um, coding of it, I've had it where I specify the severity of the episode and they denied it because of that extra digit that specified the episode. Hmm. Then there's also the fact they said within 90 days, many of these patients have been receiving treatment for years. And because they've been receiving treatment for years, they have failed more than two of the, of the required uh, medications you know, years ago, but it's because it's not within the 90 day period, you know, that it's a problem. Again, Ms. Caffey brought up again, the issue with the difference in the reimbursement, uh, but not only for, not only is it just for uh, the, the region, but it's also within terms of specialty. So again, because psychiatry is generally not uh, a procedure based specialty, then we get lower reimbursements compared to people who are doing interventions like radiology or surgeons or, you know, or, or, or other specialties like that. Uh, then of course, uh, they have the patients have to take time off from work, right? There's transportation issues. There's also, you know, language issues. And again, um, needing translators. Our, our facility has translators, but there's not enough to go around. So then you're using a language line and, and that kind of has its, has, has its own barriers. Uh, we have a diverse population in terms of, because it's the Chicago area in terms of race and ethnicity. And, and I had a situation come up the other day where uh, one of my patients came in and was with mom and um, he understood much of what I was saying, but there were maybe a thing here or there and she would translate for him. And she said, he doesn't understand English well. So I, I said to her, I said, I said, what's your native language? And you could see this look of apprehension come across her face. And uh, cause you know, I'm sure she thought maybe I might give her a hard time. So she said Arabic and I said, I said, oh, I said, I'm so sorry that I don't speak Arabic. And she said, she said, it's okay. I said, but your English is way better, way better than my ability. So those kind of things, of course, you know, uh, uh, are an impediment, you know, as well. So again, I mentioned uh, again, because of course the psychiatry, you know, it can be months, two, three months or longer for before people can get in to see me. And especially sometimes with me being a child and adolescent psychiatrist, there's maybe 7,000 of us in the whole country. So for 50 states do the math, most of them are mm -hmm. congregated again in, um, you know, cities, big cities. Um, so again, increases the need for, um, uh, uh, for care providers. And then there's the fact that because you're dealing with Medicaid, some providers don't want to take Medicaid patients, right? Because of the difficulties they have getting reimbursed. Uh, and even sometimes with some of the commercial insurances, the, re the reimbursement rate is so low that people are just wanting to take cash. You know, some mm -hmm. providers, some clinicians want cash. So, um, that's, it's, it's also that patient population is a high rate of non-adherence, meaning them taking their medications as recommended, but also them attending appointments. 
Then for the institution itself, again, money is a huge, is a huge issue. Um, we tend to be underfunded. So then you're having to get, you know, grants from other places, which when our state, like it did in, in the last year or more ago, had these huge funding issues, a lot of services actually were, went out of business because they could because they couldn't get funding. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there's also, again, so then we're competing against some of the bigger institutions. So sometimes some of our staff is getting paid um, two to three dollars an hour less. So again, where if if where would you go if you could get better pay, right? So so those are some of the issues. Again, uh, we're just getting telepsychiatry or telemedicine in our institution. There are other, there are other uh, institutions or, or, or other not-for-profits or FQAC that may have this, but right. you know, it's, it's those kind of things, the short times to treat, again, the, the racial or cultural issues because um, you know, some, the, largely the clinicians are Caucasian and if you're dealing with a diverse patient population. So um, yeah. yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot, yeah, I agree. Um, and thank you for sharing those examples. I think uh, you really spoke to how insurance can be a barrier and the cost of mental health care can be a barrier to access. And it reminds me of um, sort of the, the gatekeepers, the gatekeeping, um, the things that prevent people from getting care and, and perhaps things that could um, ensure that people get care. So I'm going to move to Reverend Lloyd now Reverend Lloyd, I consider faith leaders like yourself uh, gatekeepers for communities when it comes to recognizing and, and perhaps plugging people into um, different mental health services. You know, you talk about the role of spirituality. I've heard you talk about the role of spirituality as an important piece of overall mental well, mental well-being. Um, could you talk about, could you expand on that and talk about the role of spirituality and how it impacts mental well-being and, and perhaps how clinicians can get plugged into a, a faith leader in their area to help get patients connected to their services? Don't forget to come off mute, Dr. Uh, yeah, Reverend thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Proverbs eleven fourteen 14 um, says, where there is no guidance, a nation falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. An abundance of counselors. Um, we must work together, faith leaders and clinician. Um, when someone comes to me to talk about what their issues, what their challenges are. I have to be intentional and attentive and listen carefully to what that person has to share. Uh, I have to allow that person to share their story. And it's important that we listen with a third ear. It's important that we're compassionate it's important that we are impact and we show empathy and sympathy in some instances. It's important that we show care and we love. To love is to care and to care is to love. You've heard me say that before and it's important. Um, we have to be authentic as uh, caretakers and as clergy as well as clinicians. And so it's critical that we work together to ensure that we can assess as a, as a clergy, assess what the need of that person is, and then try and uh, refer that person to the appropriate place or facility or agency so that they can get the care that they need. Um, Lisa mentioned earlier about uh, you know transportation, uh, Dr. Durr, um, course. It, the, the reality of it uh, is, it, and in fact, my context is African American community, uh, and it, it, in my community, low to moderate income uh, community, transportation is critical. If a person works over here, for example, and if they have an appointment in another location and they're depending on public transportation, 
um, having access to um, where they need to be is difficult. There are a number of different uh, issues that you know goes into listening, assisting, helping, providing the care, providing the services that that individual need. And, and, and Lisa also mentioned something that I want to speak to for just a second, the stigma of whatever it is, depression, anxiety, mental illness. Uh, for example, I um, before I was ordained as an elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, I had to do a psychology assessment. Um, uh, and, and so the, the place where I did my assessment was not in my community, because if I went to that facility in my community and someone sees me walking in there, the mind, the, the thinking would be, oh, Reverend Lloyd has a mental problem. No wonder his wife looks at him cockeyed and cross-eyed. And so, um, you know, there is a stigma, as we all know, that's connected with people sharing their stories. And so we have to be, uh, again, intentional. We have to show care and we have to make sure, ensure that we work together to provide the help and assistance and the aid that an individual needs when they come to me as a clergy and they're speaking to their challenges. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I know Lisa, you had mentioned stigma. Let's talk more about um, stigma in small communities. Um, like you said, that game of, of telephone <laughs> um, happens in smaller rural areas sometimes. Um, so how do you address it in a rural community? How do you overcome that barrier of stigma? Oh, can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. Okay, I think I have it, sorry. I think the hardest part is forming that relationship with them as patient client versus as friend or neighbor. It's the hardest thing to work on to establish that and that everybody know in your community, even if they saw you, but like if you're doing telehealth at home, it makes it easier for them because they have no idea who you're talking to. So you can communicate that way and I can have my visit with you telehealth. And then that way our conversation is completely confidential. Nobody saw me walking into somebody's house or them coming into my office for mental health services. So I think that helps in essence. And then, um, like I said, making sure that you keep it where here's my friends and my neighbors, but then you are able to separate the professionalism and say, okay, now I'm patient client, doctor, provider versus friend or neighbor. And that makes it very hard in those areas. How do you do that? What kind of language do you use? And do you have messaging that you typically say to patients who are worried about that? I try and tell them that what they tell us here as a patient and provider that it doesn't leave the room unless you're a threat to yourself or others. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to, I'm not here to be your friend. So my conversation isn't about what Johnny did today at school or Susie did at her basketball game. It's about what's going on between with you and your mental health issues. Mm -hmm. and, but it takes a long time to build that trust. So even if you saw me today and you're kind of guarded and you tell me some things, you're really not going to get into the deep details of what's going on until you can guarantee that I'm not going to go out and tell the neighbor about our conversation. Mm -hmm. So follow-up visits are probably important yes. to establish that, that sort of trust. Building I want to build on this. Hardest. Yeah. And I want to build on this idea of lack of trust that might be a barrier to accessing mental health. So Reverend Lloyd, can I, can I turn to you? Uh, I, I want to ask you, uh, how does lack of trust in our institutions institutions in general impact people who need care, um, but choose not to seek it? Um, another, another scripture um, for us to cogitate. Jesus said, come to me, you that are weary and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Uh, the, the lack of trust creates barriers um, for individuals um, needing care. And again, I'm going to speak from the African-American context. There, as we know, there is, uh, on, there is it, we're in the midst of a, um, a pandemic and um, there are a number of different challenges and we have COVID-19 fatigue. When you couple that 
with the historical marginalization of African Americans in this country. Um, when you look at how people have been uh, psychologically, physically, emotionally, um, spiritually, spiritually and financially uh, dehumanized, it makes for a lot of um, discomfort and a lack of trust in dealing um, in institutions or, or, or dealing with, with anyone that doesn't look like an African-American. But let me also say this, the church at times can create barriers for people because when someone comes to uh, the church or clergy and they seek help, and uh, the first thing that the clergy or the church wants to do is to pray for that person, well, that that's missing the boat. Because if I'm hungry and I come to you and you pray for me and you're not feeding me, well, you haven't solved my problem. So what has to happen is um, we have to, again, going back to what I said earlier, um, assess what the true um, issues are, what the true concerns are, because people are coming to us and they're being transparent not initially, but they'll get there where they're being vulnerable. And if they're being vulnerable and they're seeking help, we have to be sure that we're intentional in providing that help to those individuals. And again, um, gearing them in the right areas where they can um, receive the help that they need. And, and going back to what I said earlier, we have to work in concert because, and then we also, let me add this, Cultural competency, and it was kind of touched on earlier, is, 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 is critical because the reality of it is Black people want to deal with Black people. Well, to begin with, they don't want to deal with anyone, but when to get to a point where they're starting to tell their stories, they would feel more comfortable dealing with an African-American and the same for white, the same for Asian and Hispanic. And so if you're not culturally aware of a person's nuances and how they communicate and, and how they move through different um, arenas, you could misdiagnose, you could get turned off or you could even turn the person off um, in your earnest to help that person. So it's important that we are aware culturally of what that person is experiencing um, and help them deal with the challenges because the barriers are real, again, because of the number of issues that we've had to deal with as a group of people. Mm -hmm. um, you, you think we talked about um, George Floyd. Um, you know, we, we could talk about the syphilis experiment in Tuskegee where African-American men were intentionally in, injected with syphilis. So naturally there's going to be a lack of trust. Naturally there's going to be barriers with someone feeling comfortable talking to a group of people where they walk in their suspect. So let me just share this one um, quote with you, if I could, yeah, I, I think I have it. Um, you know, and it, it speaks to cultural competency. Mm -hmm. When Ira Gillett, a missionary to East Africa, returned home to report on his activities overseas, he related an interesting phenomenon. Repeatedly, Gillett had noticed how groups of Africans would walk past government hospitals and travel many extra miles to receive medical treatment at the missionary compound. He finally asked a particular group why they walked the extra distance when the same treatments were available at the government clinics. They replied, the medicine may be the same, but the hands are different. Mm -hmm. People feel comfortable dealing with people that are familiar. Yeah. So, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, I want to turn to Dr. Durnow because we've had several conversations about cultural competency and uh, and how to work with that and speaking different languages. And when I say languages, I'm not just talking about English, French, Spanish, Arabic. I'm talking about figuring out a way to get your message across so that it speaks to the person who's sitting across from you. So would you please expand on that, um, that idea of cultural competency? Well, I, I think that um, to um, just to, to, to kind of add on to what Reverend Lloyd was saying in the same context, when there's this disconnect uh, 
between a clinician and uh, the person who's seeking care, uh, it then there's also a potential again for a misdiagnosis because there's a misinterpretation of what is being reported or observed, which also can be a challenge again with the patient population that I see because I, I find a lot of people don't understand their illness well. And, and, and they'll say yes and they'll say yes and no to questions they really don't understand. So that of course is contributing to misdiagnosis. Um, and um, you know, again, sometimes the patients don't agree with uh, the diagnosis may not want to take the medications, uh, may think the side effects are worse than um, the medication itself. So one of the things that, and I tell you, I have um, a, a dear friend, of, a, a dear friend of mine, um, and and he and I were both teacher and student for each other, um, uh, Reverend Evan Reed, uh, who uh, pastored Verity Center in Toronto, Canada. He just actually recently made his transition. But he and I, we would have these, these, these conversations. And one of the things I would say to him is, I said, you know, every profession has its own language. I said, and what I know is that it took me years. I remember easily four years just of residency, let alone when I was in medical school, to get comfortable using the language of psychiatry in a way that I felt I could do it easily. Um, and I said, and one of the challenges that I, that I find is that when, um, and of course I'm speaking to him in terms, about, in terms of spiritual and religious language, I said is we don't know a language, we take years to learn and understand the language. And then once we do, we go, we revert back to using the language and then the new people don't understand it. <laughs> so I said, so, and then they spend years, they spend years trying to learn and understand it too. So because of that recognition for me, what I've understood or, or, or been intentional about has been two things. Number one, um, so many people were lost in the weeds anyway and confused. So let me try to, let me try to limit the confusion by uh, making things as simple and direct as possible. Uh, and also, of course, as you notice, and, I, and, I, and I'll introduce some, and some humor into, into it also. The other thing for me is um, I see things um, from the wholeness of things, which is why, again, I was so um, excited about the fact that Reverend Lloyd was included in this conversation. And I thought, you know, Myriad Neuroscience, you all are really very forward thinking in this. Um, and, and, and so I just really want to applaud you all for that. Um, and so for me, the way I think of things in terms of multiple languages is sometimes we're having the same conversation, but using a different language. So for me, I, um, you know, offer, I say offer practical tools and solutions from the intersection of mind, body, medicine, science, and spiritual well-being. because number one, we're dealing with a whole being spirit, my, body, and mind, spirit, mind, and body. And the way I also express that and say to me, to, you know, some people say sci that there's science and there's spirituality as though they're different and they're really not. To be, sometimes people say spirituality is science we don't understand yet. And, and I also think of it as, again, a different language for the same thing. So uh, if you have an object and in English, we call it a door. In French is la porte. In Spanish is la puerta. So it's still the same object with the same uses, but different words because they're different languages. And so I think it's important to learn how to move between those languages. And at times I do, I tell somebody, I had a couple and um, the wife was my patient she was a person of faith, her husband was not. So what I did was, is I had the same conversation with both of them, but to, when I talked to him, I talked to him about science and I talked about energy and I talked about 
you know, energy becoming mass and, and moving back, you know, they move back and forth, they're equivalent to each other. You know, it's like, like water, it can be liquid, ice, vapor, it's still energy just changing forms, transforming, because the first law of thermodynamics is energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it just transforms and changes forms. So I, I say something to him, and then I switch to her, and I start talking to her in spiritual terms. So uh, I'm having the same conversation, but I'm using two different languages to, cre to create to me to express the same ideas. And so I think that um, in, in that perspective, it's really important, um, uh, especially if, if we understand the, the importance, which I think is where uh, Western medicine and what we call allopathic medicine has really we've missed, missed, the, missed the, the boat there because of this compartmentalization, um, this you know, uh, separation of mind body. And, uh, and again, uh, in the US medicine was really developed to ensure a healthy work population. Mm -hmm. So because of that, things are compartmentalized, things are you know, being scientific, other ways of treating people in terms of um, uh, you know, uh, herbalist and other naturopaths and other forms were, were really kind of um, uh, made to seem as though they were inferior, ineffective, and, and went towards allopathic medicine. And then this compartmentalization as though there's, there's though the systems are not related and interacting. I so, want to jump in there, Dr. Durr. I don't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. But I want you to go through the exercise that demonstrates that mind-body connection that we did. Okay. With the audience. Do you mind doing that? Absolutely. I, this is what, like one of my favorite things. So here's what I tell people. Your brain is not in a separate container from the rest of your body. Right. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and the, the brain health is so essential. It's foundational. You don't build a house and then put the foundation in afterwards and then go, why'd the house fall down? <laughs> because you didn't have it on a sturdy foundation. And the brain is that which everything that we experience is coming through our brain, except for some basic, simple um, reflexes. So it, it just makes perfect sense that brain health needs to be, uh, it, it needs to be a priority. And another thing I say to people is even as a person who is a believer, who you are, if you identify yourself as a spiritual being, uh, and not a spiritual doing, or if you're a human being, not a human doing, that that energy, that 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 um, spirit must must manifest or demonstrate through the filter of the mind. So the the more unhealthy it is, the more limited your abilities, your expression, and your demonstration. So to make that point to them, I have people do this very simple, but I think elegant uh, uh, and powerful demonstration of that. Um, of, of that principle. So what I want everybody to do is make sure that you um, have everything at your hands, I want your hands empty, I want people to relax. And then I want them to close, close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. And then I want you to imagine this, you too, Reverend Lloyd. I want <laughs> people to imagine this, don't do it, but just imagine it. Imagine doing a sit up. Now, someone tell me what you feel in your body. Lisa, what do you feel? I can feel like my stomach muscles are going to start tightening. That I'm like, my body is in itself is stiffening and tightening up. My brain's thinking, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to be doing this at this late at night because then I'm never going to sleep. And so, right. so, so here's, here's the, the wonderfulness of it. Yay, the wonderfulness of, of that, the beauty and the elegance of that simple exercise is that it demonstrates exactly what I was saying. We have trillions of cells in our bodies and they are all listening in to our thoughts. Uh, Dr. Durkin, I actually did the, 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 the uh, sit up in my mind. I felt, as Lisa said, I felt my stomach muscles actually tightening, even though I'm sitting, you know, I was um, contracting my stomach muscles as if I were doing the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the sit up. So yes, you're, you're, it's you're amazing. I think it's yes, a so good tool for this, people to take away from that talk. To make this point, which is, again, 
our cells are the trillions of cells they're listening in to our thoughts and and they cannot distinguish the difference between imagination or virtual reality and actual reality of doing the sit up and and that speaks volumes about how powerful our thoughts are and that we powerfully um demonstrate our beliefs every day in the choices that we make. We powerfully create with our beliefs every day through the choices that we make. So if part of, I, I, I kind of um, define mental health as both structure and function, that needs to be healthy, but it also, the thoughts that we think have to be healthy. So you, sh I tell people, you shouldn't be surprised if you've invited Chucky, Freddy Krueger, and Jason to the picnic that you scared out of your mind. <laughs> because your, 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 your brain, your body cannot tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I need to, I thank you so much. That was really helpful. Um, it's something I learned from you too in our, our conversations outside of this. But um, I have to switch gears because we have a question from the audience. Um, and it, the question has to do with transportation as a barrier to accessing mental health services. So it seems like telemedicine would be an appropriate avenue to gain greater access. What are some issues related to the provision of quality care within the telemedicine setting? And what are the community barriers to accessing telemedicine? I think Lisa, you had mentioned this um, in the, when you were answering that first question I asked. So do you mind talking about the, the issues related to the provision of quality care in the telemedicine setting and then how to overcome those actual barriers to accessing telemedicine? To start with the barriers first. Some people don't have a strong enough internet connection. Things go in and out. Um, there's always that lag time on some of them that don't have the strong enough internet connections. Um, technology, people in the older generations just don't have it. They're not there. They have trouble using a smartphone. They don't have a clue how to text, much less try to do a Zoom meeting. So going back to that, um, I think if we in terms of billing, since COVID hit, it's been a lot more easily accessible. We've been able to bill for it. And I think it's going to stay. I don't think it's going away at this point. So I think COVID in the sense of telehealth was a good thing that happened because it allows us to be able to communicate this way. That way it's more safe for the patient and you, instead of being out in the field, especially with the elderly population and them being so high risk. So, and I'd like to add something if I, if I could, because like I said, because I did tell a psychiatry, you know, for almost 10 years. Um, one of the things too was um, that, that, that I wanted to mention, one is also a challenge again with this patient population, speaking of transportation, is also sometimes childcare. So when um, you don't have to, you know, get you and the kids to a location that can also be beneficial as, as well. Uh, when I did it to, to me, um, uh, what I acknowledged was, did it have some limitations because I'm not physically in the room and that exchange of energy by physically being present? Yes. Um, but given the option of having no care, I, I felt it was, was hugely beneficial. Um, again, the other thing, the way that uh, at this, the, the place that I did it before is I had a big, huge TV screen. So for me, it felt less like what we're doing now. I'm on my laptop. So I had a big, t a, a big TV, a, a large TV. So I felt more, um, uh, uh, that I could actually see the patient and see all of them, I, you know, see their whole body. Um, I could actually observe things. I felt less less of the barrier because I had such a large because I had such a large screen. Um, one of the head and so and we said one of the hesitations about telepsychiatry really the block for it was also people were concerned that there was going to be an overuse of services, which mm. to me just is absolutely is is it, it, it again it tells you how much money is driving healthcare and driving it into the ground in some respects, because the fact that you wouldn't want people to have access, and these are people who don't have access because you think that they're, that they're, going, to, that they're going to overutilize the services, to me is really problematic. The other thing that I do wanna mention though, in terms of, the, in terms of uh, a context of COVID, 
is one of the challenges because of the pandemic and people having to spend so much more time together that people who are in abusive relationships it's actually made it more difficult for them to, to, to get to access care, even in the context of, you know, uh, say telepsychiatry, because now that person is, 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 is with them more often, they're more closely monitoring them. They can't necessarily get private time to actually um, speak with the person who would lend them some support otherwise, and because they lack the privacy. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for pointing out, that out. That's something that um, I've also heard that is um, worrisome during the pandemic and stay-at-home orders. Um, but I, I want to, um, you talked about the cost of driving care. So that brings me to introducing our fourth panelist, um, Dr. Travis Mickelson. Thanks for joining us tonight. You're welcome. I'm sorry I'm late. I, you're talking about Zoom meetings and telepsychiatry. I've been doing it all day for nine months and seem to have a really hard time logging on to this. So I am so sorry for being late. Well, that's okay. We, um, it's been a good panel so far. I'm just gonna introduce you and give you some, uh, give some background to the attendees. So Dr. Mickelson um, is a psychiatrist and he's the medical director of mental health integration at Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City, Utah. And he's at the forefront of helping primary care physicians be better mental health care providers. So. Um, I'm so glad you could join us because I would like you to talk to us about, you know, how you uh, initiated your mental health integration program at a primary care level. And since we're talking about cost being an inhibitor to mental health access, could you talk about the cost of integrating that type of care? Yes, I would be happy to. So our uh, mental health integration program was started 20 years ago. And over these last 20 years, we've been developing this program and we now have it in over a hundred of our primary care clinics. And back in 2016, our group published an uh, article in, in uh, JAMA uh, that showed that team-based care, integrating mental health into primary care settings, uh, a investment of $22 per patient per year gets a cost savings of over $122. So it was one of the first studies of a large system that really showed what we all knew all along, that if you invest money into integrating mental health in a primary care and get that mental health support upstream, then you will get cost savings down the road. Now, one of the main criticisms we had from people outside of Intermountain is Intermountain is a large healthcare system within the state of, of Utah and it includes with it its own insurance company. And so the money that was saved was money that was saved by part of Intermountain. And so for those patients who we were seeing who were say Blue Cross or United Healthcare, uh, that cost savings wasn't experienced by In Intermountain, it was experienced by the insurance company. And so that was one of the, the complaints. One of the amazing trends that we're, that we're noticing nationally that again, Intermountain is really on the forefront of is moving from a fee-for-service model to a value-based model. So not only did we show that the weekend that integrating mental health in our primary care can have cost savings in a fee-for-service model, but once we move to a value-based model, then suddenly our healthcare companies are have a certain amount of money we have available to care for that group of, of patients. And so it makes, um, it makes these programs like mental health integration even that much more valuable. So I am sure that as healthcare continues to move towards a value-based model, that more and more systems will integrate mental health in a primary care settings. Thank you, yeah. I am. Um... I discovered Dr. Mickelson's program by listening to an AMA podcast, and there's a there's a ton of resources on the AMA website. If you just search AMA and behavioral health integration, you can find a lot of resources there. Um, so I'm going to pivot now and um, address a question that was asked by an audience member. And the question is, do you find that guardians and caregivers 
are sometimes a barrier for patients, especially um, where they lack exposure to mental health issues and the stigma runs rampant. Do you have any tactics that you use to address the caregiver or guardian of the patient if you feel they're being a barrier to the patient getting treatment that they deserve? Are we, are I'll, we the I'll throw this to you, Dr. Durr, yeah. Context of children and adolescent, are we talking about adults or who, who are we talking about? I think you can answer it both ways. So okay. why don't you start with children and adolescents because that's usually where we think of caregivers. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, one of the things that um, at some point I'm going to say to the caregivers is that um, you can't bring your child to me and ask me to fix them and you're not willing to make any changes. And um, because oftentimes it's a like this, them pointing at the, the, the kid or the adolescent without their recognition of what uh, their contribution has, has, has been as, as the adult. And, and sometimes, um, you know, I've had to, to, to say to them that whatever rewards you're giving them, you're actually paying them to behave in ways that you don't want. So part of the conversation is um, getting to them to see the, the, the bigger picture in terms of what their participation is. As I like to say to people like this, does one equal two? No, one plus one equals two. So there's that person's contribution is one plus your contribution is the other one, one plus one equals two. So, you don't have you you don't you don't control what they do, but you do control what they do. Don't expect them to make changes if you're not expecting to make changes. Now, the other obviously the other con the concern or consideration is is also what is uh, what is their reason for maybe hindering care, and then that goes to what is the payoff for the caregiver. And when I say the payoff, I don't necessarily mean literally money. But how does the caregiver benefit by the patient not getting well? Um, so that that has that part has to be that part has to be figured out um, because again, if they have ideas about what it says about the person's you know uh, you know value, if I mean you're weak or bad character or you know, you should be able to do this. You should be able to do this, you know, by yourself. Uh, again, those things need to be addressed. And one of the things that I, you know, I again try to tell people is if somebody breaks your leg, then um, do you know how to heal that? If you, you usually don't, so you go get some help, right? And then there's work that you're going to have to do. So it's, it's, it's again, trying to figure out what the, what the reluctance or the resistance is about and then, and then, and then getting folks to, to, to make some shifts. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I, I see Dr. Mickelson, you're nodding along. Do you, what have you, what has your experience been with that? Well, you know, I think a couple other, other issues at play is that, that I was thinking of when you asked that question. Um, number one is what is the history of the person that has some resistance to engaging in a, with a mental health provider? And um, what a better way to make someone to dispel those fears or anxieties uh, or, or stigma than to have that family actually be able to meet someone like Dr. Durr and realize, huh, okay, I had, a, I had this idea of what a psychiatrist or a therapist was, and it seems so scary because of the movies I've, I've watched or the experience that my grandparent had or my parent had. And so not only just validating what people's history is and what their story is, but uh, there's no better way than to dispel that myth and make someone feel comfortable with sharing their story and getting help than actually meeting us. Um, you know, we are really pleasant, friendly people that uh, I, I, I don't, I think, you know, again, if my family were to meet Dr. Durr, I would not be concerned at all or worried at all because she just has that air of just warmth. And uh, so that's pr probably where some of this has to go is just 
giving us an opportunity to let us show you how good we are listening to you and validating your, your story. And as you communicate with us, probably you will feel more comfortable and that stigma will start to dissolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, makes sense. Thank, thank you. Thank you for thank you for that, Dr. Mickelson. Yeah. Although I I have to tell you though, at times though, with some of some of the adolescents, I tell people, despite my many years of training, uh, when push comes to shove, I just become my mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, she must be a good woman then, Dr. Dirt. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna. When they, I, I want to. I want to wrap up. We're almost at time, and I can't believe the time went by so quickly. Um, I want to wrap up. We're almost at time, but I want to finish up with one of the a, another question from the audience. Um, and the question is: Spirituality is important to many people with mental health issues. We've we've talked about that tonight. Um, it's one important part of recovery as well. So, how can we bring spirituality into mental health programs? Um, are there any examples that you can share? Um, and if not, how do you imagine it to be? Reverend Lloyd, do you mind if I start with you? Um, how do we bring spirituality? Um, I, th I think a good question, another way to ask this is, how would you like to be approached, you specifically, how would you like to be approached by mental health providers in the area so that you can get tapped into those resources when you recognize a need? I think it goes back to what I said earlier that we the, we have to work together. And uh, no matter what the issue is, as a clergy, as a chaplain, and um, working with uh, doctors and clinicians, we have to understand what the need of that patient is. Um, Dr. Michelson speak to something I said earlier, allow um, the individual to tell their story and be authentic in, in dealing with the person. If a person comes to us and we are not open and receptive and are listening carefully to what is being said, we miss the opportunity to be able to provide the services that that individual needs. As I mentioned uh, um, in my in responding to a question, we have to we have to listen with with uh, a third ear. We we have to be intentional in listening and intentional in wanting to assist that person. I think collaborating. Um, makes a difference when we are sharing with each other what we've learned um, about the person. We can, I, in my role, I could um, work with that person, pray with that person, walk them through whatever it is that they're dealing with spiritually. And I do believe in prayer. Let, let, let me say that. Uh, but, but faith without works is dead. Uh, um, and so we have to work co collaboratively to help that person um, become whole. Teach Reverend. <laughs> if I could just add, if I could just add one thing, I know we're, we're running out of time, but for those in the audience who, who work within a healthcare system that doesn't have a good connection with a chaplain, at, our, at Intermountain, both in our pediatric hospital and our adult hospitals, one of the most positive changes we made over the last, last nine months to help our caregivers through this pandemic was a talk to a chaplain program. If, if, you in, in, if you interview most of our providers, they are going to say that is what they most appreciate. I can't underscore how powerful that has been to make that connection uh, with our, our, the chaplains in our hospitals. It's just been a wonderful program. Yeah, that's wonderful. So I, just, I just wanted to add in terms of this, about 84% of the world's population, which is about 6.3 billion people, practice some form of religion or wisdom tradition. Um, they, they, there was only about a little over 2% of people they said that they were atheist uh, and another 14% or so they said they were not religious, but that's a huge number of people. And so again, it, I think it's, it's important to really remember that, 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 every, that each of us 
that, that we powerfully practice our beliefs in the choices that we make every day. And um, so I, I, what I do is, again, is I use, and, and I'm more familiar with Christianity than anything, is that, is that I use that as a framework for, for people, the people that come to me that are people of faith. And I, you know, I've even had one of my patients, she said, I needed to see my, my, my preacher lady. She said, when I come see you, I don't need to go to church. <laughs> So, so I use, I use that to help, to, to, to help her and to help other patients. And what I do actually is I pull out, I point out the contradictions in their faith. So for instance, that I, again, I said, people, we could, they confuse their who and their do. They, they think that they're spiritual doings instead of spiritual beings or human doings instead of human do, instead of human beings. And so I point out to them that, that who you are is not what you do. And, and, and use that to kind of help reorient the identity and to let them know that whatever you did um, is not who you are and doesn't damage you or diminish your value. Mm. And what was done to you doesn't, do, doesn't change your identity, diminish your value or, or, or worth. So it's, it's using their, their, their belief system in order to, to reframe their point of view and perspective about themselves and their possibilities. It's that it's the concept of redemption. That is so, that is such a powerful concept. Yes. Thank you Absolutely. for sharing. And I think it's really important to come away from this talk, understanding that as a clinician, you, sh you should be, or you could be acknowledging faith, acknowledging, talking to your patients about what their belief system is. And, and in that way you might, um, find out different ways to treat them. So um, thank yeah, you for you know that. What, we, we all have a belief system. We all have our BS, in other words. <laughs> <laughs> I've used that before, uh, Dr. Durr. <laughs> That's good, Dr. Durr, I like that. I, I, I hate to wrap this up, but it's already past eight o'clock. I wanna um, thank you panelists for joining us tonight. This was a very important and informative conversation. And thank you all of the attendees for joining. Um, We've recorded this session and it will be available on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, so if you have any further questions for our panelists or, or even the Genesight Cares team, you can send them, you can email them to Genesight Cares, all one word, at myriad, M-Y-R-I-A-D dot com. So I was going to say, because, you know, I, I, I'm, so, again, so thankful and appreciative to all the panelists who were, who were here. And, and, and I know we were, we were, we were going to end with a, a little pearl from, from, from everyone, but I was, so I was hoping, especially Dr. Mickelson, because, you know, he, 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 you know, joined us later. So I was just hoping to hear a little, a little pearl or something from everybody. If, yeah, if, we were going to end. We're, we're over time, okay. but uh, let's, let's go for it. So my, I, I want to ask if you have one tip or tool for attendees to take away from tonight's talk, what would it be that they could implement tomorrow in their practice? Lisa, do you mind um, coming off mute and uh, giving your little tip or, or pearl? I think the biggest part is that we need to re come together as individuals and as mental health providers in, with the continuity of care between PCPs and mental health providers to be able to pr provide appropriate care. We also need to improve and realize that whether it's positive or negative, we make an impact in rural areas. We determine whether or not they feel like they're getting good mental health services or they're getting poor mental health services because oftentimes you're, you're it. You're the only provider that's available to them. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, who should I go to next for a quick tip? Uh, to, for me, I, I said it earlier, um, to love is to care and to care is to love. And, and given the space that we're in right now, and it sounds so soft and mushy and corny, but it's a realism. We need to learn how to love and we really need to learn how to care. I, I agree, especially now. Yeah. Very good message. Thank you. Dr. Durr? Well, for me, it's just, the, it's just this. Um, our brain health is essential 
because again, our brain is not in a separate container from the rest of our body. And if you understand that, then you understand that when, you know, when your brain is ill, that means that brain cells are dying and that um, we, we need to normalize uh, the need to, to, for brain health the way we do uh, when you would treat diabetes or when you would treat heart disease or, or anything, the brain can become ill just like er any other part of the body can be. And I think, you know, we're, we're talking about things on the back end and really what we're missing is on the front end. And on the front end, how do you, how do you improve people's desire to use the, the resources and, and people's desire to become um, clinicians in mental health is you have to increase the value. So how you increase the value is by getting people to understand that, it, that brain health is essential, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think at a very young age, and but, but for everybody, not just certain people, but kids, adults, uh, professionals, everybody needs to recognize the essential importance of maintaining brain health. Yeah. And normalizing the way we talk about it. I yeah. completely agree. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Dr. Mickelson. Yes. I will build off of that. Um, we, we have made amazing progress over the last 20 years at, at fighting stigma and improving access to mental health care. And we need to keep thinking and keep looking upstream. And we need to make sure that our primary care clinics and, and providers are supported because that's where a lot of mental health care happens. And that's where families feel safest. And I think that uh, the silver lining of this COVID has really highlighted the value and importance of mental health. And I think as we move towards value-based care, that there will be only more and more uh, emphasis placed on, on what we're doing. And I'm so pleased to be a part of this panel and very sorry that I was late. <laughs> <So bad. laughs> no, it's, it's fine. We ran out of time anyway. So, um, but uh, yeah, that, that makes a, a, a lot of sense. So thank you so much for those tips and those pearls that we can leave the audience with. Again, if you have questions after this webinar, if you, something pops into your head tomorrow, please email genepsychcares at myriad.com. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you panelists. It was such a pleasure to spend this time with you. Um, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy and, um, and uh, that's it for tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.